afternoon, everyone, and welcome back to the Brainy Boomer Lecture Series. We're so very happy you've all joined us today. In 2007, the McGill University Research Center for Studies in Aging started the Brainy Boomer Lecture Series in order to suggest practical steps to both improve and maintain brain health, as well as to promote healthy lifestyle choices amongst the most populous generation in history. The MCSA's Education Committee, which was founded in 1996, has three main objectives. Identifying education needs of healthcare providers, seniors, caregivers, and the public, and to develop responses to meet some of those needs. To a positive image of the aging process by addressing stereotypes and myths about aging. And finally, the dissemination of research on aging. Today's event is in collaboration with the Observatory on Aging and Society. The OAS is a nonprofit organization that has been active in Quebec for nearly two decades. It has given itself the mission of improving the quality of life of seniors and the challenges of ageism and its consequences within our society. The OAS wishes to change the way we look at aging and seniors and innovates by using various means to raise awareness among seniors. Before continuing, we would like to remind you to please mute your microphone on Zoom. And then if you have any questions, just wait until the discussion period, or you could write, uh, wait for the end of the conference or write them down if you have them on Zoom. Uh, also, before continuing, I would like to bring your attention to the fact that today's event will be recorded um, for potential posting later on uh, websites or on YouTube channel. <coughs> and now I'd like to invite Dr. Namiash to begin her presentation on her ageism awareness workshop. So good morning, everybody. Uh, many of you know me because I've been part of the Brainy Boomers uh, Conference and uh, McGill Center for Studies on Aging for a long time. Um, it's a big pleasure to see so many of you here this morning uh, to talk about ageism awareness. Um, it's not exactly a workshop, it's basically more, 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 and it's not the usual lectures that I give. I am going to try to do some very short discussions on some of the issues involved in ageism, because I think most of you know probably what ageism is. Um, so I'd like to hear a bit about people's personal experiences about ageism and how we could perhaps prevent it, et cetera. So that's gonna be my focus because we only have an hour and the hour goes very, very fast. So I would like the next, I'd like to thank Caitlin, of course, for organizing it and from McGill Center for aging, uh, organizing it. So as, as Caitlin already said, basically, uh, that the Observatory on Aging and Society is the organization that actually did the work on ageism and their main mission actually is ageism. And the mission is to improve the quality of life of seniors and address the challenges caused by ageism and its impact on our society. I'll skip the rest and move on so that we don't spend too long. So the organized cafe fellow also some interesting philosophic discussions on different uh, a aging topics, topics connected with aging and gerontology in general and, and philosophy. So uh, I wanted to just mention that if anybody's interested, they're free. Next, please. <clears throat> These are the type of topics that they're having now in the schedule. I know you don't have time to write them down, but if anybody's interested, they can always contact me and I'll give them more info. Next, please. They have a, a month, bi-monthly newsletter, um, basically, which is uh, like ours in McGill and uh, very interesting articles on aging and ageism in general. Next, please. And it's also free, the subscription. So these are some of the topics that they've carried out. I'll mention the action researches that they've done already, ageism in the workplace, ageism in the healthcare environment, ageism in the medium, media, and ageism at a glance, which is this one. And we, this is a, uh, we got a grant from New Horizons uh, for this particular project. And I was recruited to do just the English ones throughout the province. So I'm going throughout the province of Quebec talk to all of the English communities that I can find um, and to spread a little of the awareness of ageism. Next, please. Next, please. This is just the info about the society and what we look like. Next, please. <clears throat> so I wanted to move on to the objectives of today's workshops. 
workshop or discussion. Basically, it's exchanges on the phenomenon of ageism from illustrations, comics. Basically, uh, you will be getting, if you didn't already receive them from Caitlin, um, 24 comic, uh, little comic uh, strips. And um, it's, this is why I got involved in this, uh, this topic, because it's, it's been around a long time, ageism, but nobody's really Nobody really talks about it very much until the pandemic. And this pandemic has brought on a lot of discussions about ageism and with how it's being applied in terms of treatment of older adults, etc. And also how we apply it to our own personal experiences. This is what we want to look at today as well. And to understand it so that how we can face ageism and, and perhaps be able to counter it or to prevent it in some ways. I'm going to mention these a little bit, and particularly at the end, I will summarize uh, four of the ways in which I think we could counter it. Next, please. <clears throat> so the organization defines ageism as a set of negative attitudes and biases towards seniors and aging. Often irrational, ageism can lead to the marginalization and disempowerment of older adults. So basically people feel disempowered, they feel excluded from society, et cetera, uh, when ageism, ageist policies or ageism in institutions or ageism in general from other people uh, happens. It can happen by individuals to one another, it can happen by groups, it can happen by society and institutions. Thank you. So basically, uh, ageism is a form of abuse, abuse of older adults, but also abuse, ageism applies also to younger adults as well. Anybody who's discriminated against because of their age basically is subject to ageism. Um, in this case, the United Nations was particularly um, feels that uh, we should pay a lot of attention to elder abuse. I have given already several lectures with the McGill uh, Center for Studies on Aging on Elder Abuse. So I think you've all heard me talking about it in detail before. They mentioned the importance of it and that ageism is just one form of this. And it includes physical and psychological abuse, neglect, abuse, and discrimination in many forms, including ageism. Basic, basically, ageism is often being talked about societal treatment of older adults which is part of it, but it can also be individual to how we treat one another. Next, please. So just to give the, once again, the uh, definition of what abuse is in general, it occurs when a single or repetitive act or a lack of an appropriate action, whether intentional or unintentional, occurs in a relationship where there should be trust and causes harm or distress to a senior. So ageist attitudes also cause harm or distress to a senior or a group of seniors or a whole society of older adults. Next, please. So it's subtly manifested. This is one of the reasons why it's not talked about a lot because people don't really um, notice all the time what is ageist example i remember people telling me that i should dye my hair uh, like everybody else does i don't choose to but basically uh, i found that ageist really because if they think i should look younger uh, was the point of the, of the thing so basically it's very subtly manifested and it manifested all the time we look in the mirror and we say oh my god i'm old we have a disease we say it's because i'm old there are all kinds of reasons why um, it's there all the time but we don't necessarily notice it in the same way that we didn't notice elder abuse when it first uh, when we started to first diagnose and realize that it existed so it's manifested through beliefs, our beliefs, and other people's beliefs, attitudes, and behaviors that exclude a person on the basis of age. So that's the basic way in which we can know if uh, the thing that is being displayed is ageist or not. 
It results in oppression, discrimination, and even exclusion of older adults. And ageism is the racism and sexism related to age. <clears throat> this is important because we've been talking a lot about sexism, how women are paid less than men and all the other sexist uh, situations, racism, especially the last few years, we've finally uh, figured out that there is so much racism and it's time we did something about it. And now it's time perhaps also to mention because of the pandemic, that so many thousands of people, in fact, 80% of the people who died in the uh, pandemic were older adults. And not only were they older adults, but they were also people mainly in long-term care and the most vulnerable people in our society. So that's part of the reason why I feel that I have to shout about ageism from the rooftop, because I think that we have to look at societal values and how society is treating and how it's treated older adults. We've had a lot of problems throughout the ages, throughout the last few years, um, particularly in Canada, and also particularly in Quebec, of having very um, inappropriate care happening in long-term care centers, et cetera. And we haven't really done anything about it and we haven't shouted it from the rooftops. So this gives me an opportunity to be able to talk about it a little bit and for you to talk about it and to tell me if you think that it's ageism or if it's not ageism. Okay, next please. So here we're gonna have a very short discussion now just like a little brainstorming about ageism itself. Have you witnessed situations? How would you react in such situations? Or how do you react? And what, what, what can we do to improve it? Mainly the first two for now. So have you experienced similar situations? And do you think that our population in Quebec who are in, for example, um, in, in uh, long-term care homes have uh, witnessed si similar situations, etc. So I give you now five minutes. I'll try not to talk and let you talk till 11.25. At 10, yes, 11.25. So who's gonna start? Thank you, uh, Madam Bushi. Lynn, yes. Okay. Um, I'm just trying to, un can you hear me? Yes, perfectly. Okay. I worked 48 years in a long-term care center and mm -hmm. I'm now on um, a committee that they have uh, and it has changed a lot, but there's still a lot to be changed. Uh, things like uh, schedules for showers or baths without consulting the person and asking them when they would like. And, and you have certain constraints because of the number of um, residents that you have, but also the types of activities that there are. And I know that one of them, things that they expressed um, were, was the fact that they weren't allowed to go out and take walks or they weren't, they had to be accompanied by someone and there was not always someone to do that with them. But also, you know, perhaps the way that they were talked to. And um, I think we did a lot to um, set up a committee where they would have representation as to what types of activities were being going to be offered. What, what were, did they feel they were missing? Uh, especially reacting very quickly when they weren't treated politely or their, their ideas weren't being listened to. Um, so I, I'm very sensitive to things like this and I'm still active in the committee. I'm on their committee and I'm on another committee for seniors in a small town called Rodden in Quebec. Mm -hmm. And it's for Anglophones because uh, I'm, I speak English. <laughs> but I'm on another committee with the municipality called MADA where uh, municipalité au aidant des aînés. And that is a good committee because it helps us to develop things within the community for seniors. 
Excellent. Thank you very much for your comments. Is anybody something else to add? It doesn't have to be only about the treatment of people in uh, care homes. It can be how it's how how you are treated or how your group is treated, etc. Any more comments? Everybody's shy at the beginning. You could just raise your hand if you want to say something. I see, Carol, you want to say something? But you have to unmute your button. Good, yes. Can you hear me now? Yes, perfect. Yes, a similar idea. I was working at a, a senior home for about six years, and um, I was sort of the one in charge charge of the workers, the nursing assistants. And if I say to them, I went into John Brown's room and it was untidy. She wasn't smelling well. She cannot go downstairs like that. I thought they were happy with me, criticism, the constructive criticism. You know what they did? They went to the boss and tell her I'm bossing them and I'm pushing them around and they let me go. Yes. So they think that these elderly were not doctors, they were not nurses, they were not secretaries. They should walk and tidy and smell bad. Come on, they have clothes, they're human beings too. I said to them, you have grandmothers, you have mothers, come on. You can't treat them like this. Yeah. And they were mad at me. So I can see where you're saying the disrespect in, in bath, clothing, you know, respect about walking and all these things. You chuck things on them, you don't ask them, you do what you want. So a lot of elderly have been abused, not just by the pandemic. If the COVID did not come in, the world wouldn't see what they are suffering from. My opinion from, from experience. Actually, I agree. I did say, <laughs> yes, I, Sorry, I, I did the say pandemic that for the COVID. exposed everything. It was there exactly. before. Yeah. Anybody else want to make a comment and then we'll move on? Yeah, we have uh, Astri who would, has her hand raised, so you can unmute oh, yourself if you'd like. Yeah, I can see it, actually. Yeah. <laughs> I'm not too sure how you teach respect for older people, which I think is probably the basis of it all. How do you teach that? Some of our, some other um, countries, it's innate in their culture, but for us, it's not. And until we can find a way of doing that, I'm not tone of voice. I'm not tone of voice. Yeah, but it's to teach it to our children, to teach it. To, how can you teach respect? You know what I mean? I know what it is to respect. It is tone of voice. It's all of those things. But we somehow we have to kind of change that whole attitude that these, are, these old people are worth nothing. I think it starts with, your, with people's grandparents and grandchildren uh, a lot, because I think if you model this, and if you find they're being respectful and you correct it and talk about it um, so in an understandable way, I think that that, <coughs> well, I see my grandchildren are very respectful. Um, Probably because I, I wouldn't tolerate a lack of respect either. I think that uh, we have to kind of speak up, as you were saying, talk about it. So can we move on to the next? That's lovely to listen to your opinions. And that's what this is. About. So we will be talking again. Now we have a very specific, the first of our comic strips, which is basically about infantizing. Uh, this is in the health sector because there's lots of examples in the health sector. Most of them are in the health sector, uh, actually, or the government sector, I think. But treating people like children. So somebody comes into the doctor's office, uh, a daughter, and she brings her older mother. And uh, the doctor looks at her and says, how is she doing today? She says to the caregiver. And the older lady says, who are you talking to? If you're talking about me, then I can answer for myself. Doctor, there's no need to address my daughter. So we see this, I think, quite a lot. And uh, it's 
often possible to observe on the part of professionals, paternalistic, condescending, and infantilizing behaviors and remarks toward elderly patients. I, I, don't, I wouldn't even write patients if I were writing this myself initially. However, the elderly, like everyone else, must be able to express their needs and desires freely and be consulted and listened to without fear of triggering contempt. And we have to make sure that people are listened to, etc. So that's a bit the prevention of it. Um, have you had experiences, any of you? Now you get another five minutes to talk about any experiences of being treated like children, that older adults are, or yourselves or other people um, or other or other examples in the health sector where we see basically ageism so who's going to speak first if you want caitlin you can turn this off so that we can see more people so that maybe that'll inspire them to talk more <laughs> i'd like to i'd like to say a, a couple of things um, uh, hi hi dr daphne hi caitlin hi everyone you don't uh, have i have to go to by the way <laughs> even if thank i you. have a phd I <laughs> <laughs> thank you um i have an elderly mom uh, and I've experienced this infantilization uh, syndrome, if we want to call it a syndrome, and I find it very uh, disempowering for the, for, the, for the patient or the person. Uh, and, and, you know, I'm wondering if there's ways of, of even, you know, educating uh, the, the medical uh, system to say, you know, everybody's a person regardless of age. Uh, and I've also witnessed it um, in long-term care. Uh, I have an aunt, who, well, an aunt who passed away now. But she was in long-term care for oh boy about seven years. She saw she had suffered a stroke, uh, and and it would just pain me to go visit her, because you know as I walk through the hallway, I see a number of elderly people in their beds. Uh, many of them were mistreated or treated as if they were children. Um, you know, if they would call out because they needed something, people just didn't, you know, respect them. They they just assumed that oh you know leave her alone. I mean I I sometimes walk into different rooms to help patients or to you know just to see what the person needed. And you know oftentimes I'd get a you know a nurse walking in saying oh leave her alone. She doesn't really know what she's talking about. You know so I I just find that there's so little respect that we give uh, to people that really need it. And it's just, you know, one day, if we live long enough, we'll all be there. <laughs> and, and it's so important to, 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 you know, to do something about it. And uh, someone earlier was talking about, I think it was Carol saying that, you know, uh, what could we do or not? Actually, I think it was Astri who was saying, how could we educate, uh, you know, our, our younger, our newer generation? Uh, something could be said about that too, because it starts in the home. And I find my mother has been, uh, you know, not neglected in the sense of neglect, but, you know, many of her grandchildren don't really call her on a regular basis. And my sister and I try our best to say, you know, you should call Nonna and see how she's doing. Uh, and no one seems to have time, you know. So what, what does that say, you know, in terms of, of all the stuff, all that they've done, right? And now we find themselves, you know, my mom is in a, in a residence, an autonomous residence. Luckily, at 93, she's still autonomous. Uh, but there's a lot of, she's lost a lot of um, will to live uh, because she doesn't get the exposure and the stimulation from people that she loves. People have just kind of, you know, stepped away. And I find that unfair. You're absolutely right, I think. I think. So how can we how can we uh, teach younger people or, or encourage more intergenerational relationships? As not necessarily, I mean, obviously we have to teach people values. We used to teach them a lot through the church, through the schools, etc. I think we still do. I think we have supposedly good Canadian values, but somewhere along the line, I think everybody's very busy. And uh, somehow they don't, they don't, uh, they're not aware, I think. I think Lynn had her hand up. Yeah, I'm sorry. Yeah. I, I think I was basically going to say what you said. I think it's important that your children 
are, um, they see your parents as part of the family and you do things like Sunday, my mother always did Sunday dinner. So my kids, as a, just lately, my, my son said to me, mom, we always used to go to uh, grandma's for, for Sunday dinner. Let's start it up again. And for my grandchildren, that's, a, that's an important thing. They need to see everybody. They need to cook with me. They need to, so that as I age, they get used to seeing me age. It gets to be a natural part of the family. And, yeah, and, and do things like walking and, and uh, going and sitting outside and, and having a cup of tea, you know? My, my ch grandchildren love tea with a little bit of honey. It's, it's, it's something, uh, anyway, that's all I have to say. I can go on and on. <laughs> <laughs> I think I just wanted to add, I think it's so important to the integration process and what's happened, um, you know, people would, would age at home if we're looking at, you know, half a century ago, right? And they would age with their families. So people would get to see, as Lynn said, the aging process, right? What happens now is that, you know, everyone is so busy uh, and people go to work. And the minute that someone is, you know, incapable of living at home, they're often shipped over to, <laughs> you know, they're, they're brought to a, a long-term residence or they go into an autonomous uh, you know, residents, and then it's wonderful because there's activities for that age group, but that's not the only thing that encompasses life. I think they need to be exposed and integrated with all ages in order to still feel that. You know, when, when I see, it, um, when I go visit my mom at the residence and I see the older uh, residents there, they love, they, they lighten up when they see a younger person walking in. And I often, well, before the pre-COVID, you know, I would sometimes sit with them and we chat and, and they, they get, they, they feel connected to the outside world. And that's so important, even for longevity and to, you know, maintain our, our livelihood, uh, as opposed to just being surrounded and thinking about, you know, sickness and illness and, and end of life. You know, we need to still feel as long as we are living and breathing, we need to look at all aspects of life and enjoy every part of it. And we can do that through our children, through our grandchildren. And so integration, I think, is key. This is why I think that these discussions are very important, that we shouldn't just give lectures to people about aging, but we should do more societal discussions, uh, group discussions, small group discussions. I think that is very uh, interesting and very provokes a lot of reflection that uh, we don't do enough of, I think, in our society. And I used to run actually, um, actually through McGill also. It was a project of McGill Studies on, uh, on Aging and also a project of a, a committee that I was running at the time, NDG Community Committee on Elder Abuse. We used to run uh, in high school classrooms uh, uh, programs between seniors and uh, young high school students. And um, we used to talk about ageism and I used to show videos about uh, different things and um, they, they would discuss them. And we did an ageism uh, quiz at the beginning by Edmore Palmore and one at the end to measure how much people had learned or changed their attitudes during the, the school thing. And we actually presented it in the Canadian Association of Gerontology. Unfortunately though, I haven't seen many of these kinds of projects for a long time. And maybe we should be generating some of those kinds of projects or these kinds of discussions. This is in the area of politics and government. This is where we get a little bit more political and it may be into talking a bit more about the uh, pandemic, but there are other issues too that seniors have been often said to be very uh, costly to society. Um, and if you talk about money and improvement of uh, the long-term care, the government will answer that, oh, we can't afford to do this. Well, the question, question that um, this um, is two ladies sitting talking and they say, I'm tired of being told how I should contribute to society. We're constantly solicited to vote during election period, but the rest of the time we are ignored. It's the politicians who speak for us. And basically, I think to some degree, 
um, it's seniors are always extremely important uh, at election time to the politicians because we're a very large group and we're going to be an even larger group in the future. So we should be able to affect government policy about treatment towards seniors. Um, is this happening? What do you think about this? The many harmful misconceptions about seniors, the contributions of seniors, which must be recognized by our society. Look how much caregivers uh, basically uh, give in terms of uh, unpaid hours. Uh, they give so much, uh, so many contributions towards society as volunteers, caregivers, and other, other uh, ways. So I think we need to recognize that, and we need to get the politicians and everybody in society to recognize the contributions as well as just the other things that they talk about. So let's talk about this for a few minutes. I'd like to see the group again. I have a few elderly friends and all the time when I speak to them, they said to me, God, when they want us, they know us. And he never, never care that we need. They promise us, they promise us, but nothing. But when it's time to vote, they know the elderly. We are the first to go, the first for everything. In the COVID, we are the first to get the injection to kill us off. But nobody from the CLSC won't even come to help us if we don't press on. So it's true. There's a lot of elderly are being neglected, and they need more hours more than what they are getting. This is where the government should focus. Instead of the babies and the young mothers, I think elderly need a lot of attention too. So how could we do something about this? What we could ask for volunteers like me, when she needs some, I would say, oh, I went to Maxi and Maxi have that, that, that. She said, get it for me, Carol, and I pay you back. We need people like to reach out who don't have a lot of families here, you know, just mm -hmm. to bring them something. Sometimes we don't, I don't even take the money. I said, it's okay. She said, God bless you. I love that word, God bless you, yes. One thing that I found is good about the, um, uh, the pandemic is that I found that the senior organizations who are aware of what's going on and, and, and who have become horrified by the number of deaths and the, the, the numbers of uh, mistreatment that's been going on uh, during the pandemic and the fact that they were there before, the, the, I, I find a lot of organizations now are joining together in the coalitions and actually doing more about the situation and writing letters to the governments. And if you look at the media now, it's full of what's going on. Whereas normally people sit back and they don't do anything, even though the same situations were pretty much there be, before, except not to such an extreme. You'll see this. True. The Gazette this week, I will, uh, I will have written a letter in the, uh, in the editor's uh, section um, about some of the things. And I have been writing many letters to the government uh, in my organization, which is Handicap Life Dignity. Um, and that's what everybody could be doing as individuals, as groups, as uh, McGill too could be writing some letters, I think, to, to, to really talk about some of the things that are going on. So I, they probably are, and they are speaking, I'm sure. But I think we need to speak out. That's one thing we need to do, not to keep silent. But if we keep silent, then nothing, everything goes the same. And after the pandemic, everything will be the same. The government's done very little about changing things, truthfully. So, Next. Good, good morning or good afternoon. Good morning. I'm, my name is Tom O'Higgins and I'm sitting here with my McGill alumna wife, Dr. Eleanor Elman. We're, we're speaking from Dublin. Yes. And just to mention an outsider's view, uh, some years ago in Ireland, the government was proposing during the, the aftermath of the financial crisis, to cut back on st the state pensions for older people. Mm -hmm. They're quite generous actually in Ireland, uh, much more generous than they are uh, in the country 
next to us across the water that we speak about occasionally, uh, Great Britain. <laughs> Where I'm but, from. Uh, but there is an organization that I was asked, I should say that I'm a former finance person, I was a former partner at Price Waterhouse, but I was asked to chair a, an umbrella group called the Older and Bolder Campaign. And it was a, a collective, as has been referred to earlier, of organizations that looked after the interests of older people. And we, we, we were normally a very quiet lobbying group, but we brought uh, nearly 60,000 people out on the street in Dublin one day in front of the parliament to protest about the proposal to cut back on state pensions. I can tell you very quickly, the government reversed its policy and the, the generous state pensions were uh, returned. And by and large in Ireland, uh, there is quite a lot of respect for older people. And partly, I think the politicians, if on the political force, they know the power of what we call the grey vote. Uh, and they know that it, consistently in elections, older people tend to vote uh, uh, much, much more the, uh, that cohort votes than younger cohorts. So it is a very powerful group. And most, most political parties dare not uh, offend the older uh, voters, but whether it's out of uh, uh, a philosophy or is out of uh, trying to retain power, the treatment of older pe people by the political system is actually quite good here. I just thought I'd make that observation from Perfect. a totally different sort Thank of society very, across the world. Very interesting to bring uh, ideas from other countries as well. Okay, the workplace, something for the few gentlemen who are with us today, but uh, also for the ladies. Um, in general, ageism is uh, quite active in the work experience, basically. Um, and here is a, a cartoon about um, this gentleman who is waiting for a job interview. And already the decision is that talking amongst themselves, they're saying, not him, he's too old, he's completely outdated. So basically, um, a lot of people uh, have been um, treated in a negative way because they're too old, as their companies um, changed uh, and became more technological and uh, Instead of training and giving the, the older workers skills, people have been basically uh, just ignoring them or looking at them. And even, even when I took this uh, contract myself, I had to think about it. Am I too old? Uh, should I be still taking in a contract, et cetera? It only lasted a second though. And I, this, and I found the challenges in taking on new things and learning new things, they're difficult, but very important for all of us, I think, to keep our brains sh sharp and to keep uh, being useful members of our society, not just useful, but also um, it's meaningful for us in our lives. So any discussion about work experience? It's very easy for us to think as we get older that we are too old to do this and that and the other, I think. Uh, we can also be have what we call self-ageism, where we impose ageist attitudes on ourselves, uh, as I was all, all doing when I asked myself, am I too old? Um, since I'm going to be 80 in my next month, actually. Um, and where, how do you know when you're too old to do this or that or the other? Is it about age or is it about basically um, motivation, challenging ourselves? new opportunities. This is a way to counter it, I do believe, because I think it's, uh, the more I take on personal challenges, the better I feel. And the more I seem to keep my brain moving, because I was very concerned at the beginning of this pandemic. How are we going to manage? We're not going anywhere, we're not doing anything. It's so easy to kind of sit and get into a depression when you've been a very active person. I don't know if any of you have uh, had that experience of feeling that, or if you've all been really good at uh, avoiding it and doing 
keeping very busy. What have you been doing all the time to keep your brains active? Yes, yes Dolly. Yeah, I wanted to make a comment. You're saying everything is true. I agree with you. But I think at the same time, we also at our age have to be a bit realistic and to think if you think that you are not able to manage or if you're not, you should be able to uh, admit to yourself and lower your pace or ask for help and not keep on doing something where you may fail. And that is much more difficult to absorb and much more difficult to deal with than success. Mm -hmm. So I think we have to be a little bit realistic because you are the only one who will know whether you can do it or not. Nobody can tell you that. You know, I cannot tell you that, yes, you are able to do it. Please go ahead and do it. You should know that. You know. Yeah. But we could find challenges that are maybe less. Exactly. Less exactly. Difficult. I mean, there are always new opportunities and challenges. They don't yeah. have to be big things. They can be small things too. Yeah. Um, Anybody, any other comments to make about this? Yeah, we have Astri who has her hand raised. Yeah, um, I'm sure you will all agree with this. I'm a member of the McGill Community for Lifelong Learning. And that's how one of the, I think one of the best ways it's open to everybody. It's not uh, academic, but it's learning. I think through learning, through becoming really actively involved in a learning organization, that it helps us to um, stay relevant, stay current and stay smart. Well, that's good news. So we should all keep on learning new things. <laughs> and I think that's what McGill Brainy Rumors does. Uh, I think uh, basically it helps us a lot to keep keep on learning new things and but I think there should be more discussion as well as just uh, lectures because I, I think in lectures it assumes that we know everything and we don't. Uh, I think uh, we learn as we also listen to other people and learn from other people and other people's opinions and what works etc and what doesn't. Yeah, I just have to say that that I want that's not what we are about. We're a participatory and discussion group. So that's the that's a really important part. And you put your finger on it. It's learning from each other's experiences, sharing our experiences, you know. And that's empowering too, I think. Yeah. They say that empowerment is the biggest antidote to ageism. So that's one of the solutions. So how do you think that um, we can be more empowered? I think that's part of the discussion. Besides taking on big challenges, which, which we might fail at, as Ellie said. <laughs> yes, Mary, did you want to say something? Because I see you talking, but I, <laughs> I don't hear you. No, OK. You can just also put your hand finger up or your hand yeah, up. No, I know. There, there's somebody else here and that I had to speak to. Oh. That's why. <laughs> um, there are two people sitting talking. And this one person says to his friend, I don't feel like using this. It's too uh, complicated and I'm too old. It's for young people, not for me. This is how we also put on ourselves uh, aging attitudes. Um, my husband was like that. My, I, ha I have to say that everybody, uh, all the kids in, in our family, the young people, they called him Mr. Anti-Technology. Because on principle, he refused to use any technology. But as I said, there are a few good things that happened in the pandemic because suddenly he felt he's a big communicator and he always communicates a lot with other people. He's a very social person, et cetera. So basically, it was very difficult. We're supposed to be confined all the time. If you're over a certain age, you're not allowed to do this. You're not allowed to do that. You, there's a big feel, feeling of confinement. And suddenly, I saw him using his 
uh, the children, of course, have been buying us throughout the ages uh, new technology, uh, iPads and telephones and the smartphones, et cetera. And so I suddenly find him using them. And he's become quite skilled, actually, even though he's uh, 83, but he's actually uh, quite able now to use uh, um, the iPad, et cetera, very well, because he had no choice in a way in order to uh, function he, it, uh, and to socialize more. He had to not only phone people, but also use some of the technology to keep him occupied, to amuse himself, et cetera. So basically, I think, well, even me, I did my doctoral thesis and I, never, I had somebody typing the whole thing, which cost me a fortune, uh, when I could have actually sat uh, and used it. The, the reason that I, I used technology myself was because I got a job as a professor at the University of Laval, an adjunct professor, and suddenly I'm sitting in an office with in front of me is a computer and I had to do everything by computer and I never had a lesson. So basically I just started to try to use it. I asked a few things every day to different people and kind of eventually it became a big part of my life. So it's, it's, it's a new challenge, um, but it's very easy to say, look, I'm too old to learn to use it. And I think in, in this generation, it's very difficult to get along without using any technology. You go to the bank, everything you do, basically, you have to use some te technology pretty well. So what do you people think about it? This is a way in which intergenerational projects help because um, I've seen in some of my organizations, I had a lot of seniors present because the organization started out by teaching the seniors how to use Zoom. None of us knew how to Zoom. We didn't even know what Zoom was and we didn't know how to use it and it was pretty terrifying at the beginning. But that particular organization who started out with the lesson about Zoom, they had the most, uh, the highest number of seniors there. And some of them, when I had called them to see if they wanted to participate in this discussion, they said, oh, none of our seniors can use Zoom. And that's kind of sad in a way, because you're really, there are so many exciting things being put on Zoom, whether it's exercises, physical exercises like McGill put on or, Wonderful programs, actually, spiritual programs, church services, all kinds of different things that have been on Zoom, which really have helped to make you feel less isolated. And people who are not on Zoom uh, at all, or don't know how to use any technology, I think they're more isolated. Yes, Lynn. Muted, sorry. I, I was not, uh, I'd never heard of Zoom before this whole pandemic. And it's incredible the number of things people will say to me, how are you doing? You're living all alone. My husband passed away in August. So mm -hmm. there's been many changes in my life that I'm here alone. I'm lucky I have my children and grandchildren in Rodden. But we have to see each other, you know, on, we can go for a walk, but we're spaced. We're, uh, but the number of things on Zoom, my church service is now on Zoom, as you mentioned, mm -hmm. the McGill things. There's another community group in the, in the village that does activities on, on uh, Zoom. It's incredible. And I, I'm not a computer expert for sure, but it, I think there are certain things that you can learn. You don't have to use everything on a computer, no. that it really makes a big difference. I don't know most of you, but several of you I've seen on other McGill programs we've had, and it, it does, it's, I haven't been totally alone this morning. It, it made a big difference. Yes. I think COVID has had a silver lining because with in, because of Zoom, we have been able to meet so many people and visit all over the world. When yes. we have conferences, now we can invite anybody from anywhere. They don't have to travel. There's no airfare. There's no hotels. There's no nothing. And it's free. So yes. it's just such a big boon. Yes. I mean, we have to thank COVID for that, you know, to getting us together on Zoom. 
Yeah. I, so I, I just wanted to say that I also run a seniors group on Saturdays and uh, it's been like pulling them into the 21st century. I got a grant to buy tablets for them and to get them to learn technology because I'm like you, I taught myself, you know, I mean, they put a computer in front of me in the 70s and 80s and they were hard to use them. They weren't as friendly as they are now. And it was just trial and error and whatever worked, I said, oh, thank God I've done it here. You know, you can have it. But uh, I, I teach them and only half my seniors have learned, but uh, because of COVID, all, everything gets interrupted. So, you know, they want one-to-one -one instruction. They want, um, uh, what do you say, uh, repetition. You know, repetition is very important. The same thing has to be taught to them again and again, and then it happens. And But, you know, they can do their banking, they can do their uh, doctor's visits, they can talk to their pharmacists, they can do so many things and connect with their grandchildren, which they want to do. And it, it's, it's just important. I am a little bit, and please forgive me if it sounds a, a little bit weird, but I didn't want to use Zoom. Um, I wanted to use Skype, which is old technology, but at least uh, it's Canadian, it's North American, and uh, uh, tried Google, but there's too much echo. They haven't refined it enough. Uh, and uh, uh, so uh, I, I preferred not to use the Zoom, but it is in my life. I, I use it at least three or four times for meetings every day. Uh, and yes, it's wonderful. I don't have to wear my pajamas. I can just <laughs> let them see the top part of me and that's it. But I mean, you know, I don't know why there's ageism in the workplace. Because I mean, look at Joe Biden, look at Nancy Pelosi, look at all the people. I mean, I know they're bunch of dinosaurs. We are a bunch of dinosaurs, but we've learned what works, what doesn't work, what has to be done, what doesn't have to be done. We don't take time off because we partied too late last night. I mean, you know, it's wonderful to get to bed by 10 o'clock or whatever and be ready for work. If you don't get to work in the morning, um, you're all dressed up and nowhere to go. I mean, like there's no structure to your day. I just love working. I want to keep working. I just want a life that's full of work. And uh, that's all I can say. And I wish that there was no ageism in the workplace. And the, yeah, go. <laughs> Sorry. Thank you, Mahanas. Yes, uh, Ms. Higgins or Higgins. What is your first can name? You can you hear me, Eleanor? Yeah. Eleanor, okay. Eleanor. Uh, yeah, I just, um, I'm the McGill alumna. Uh, I just want to make it, I'm also an adjunct, adjunct professor in uh, Dublin and in London, doing um, some work with students, but, and also some uh, running webinars occasionally, etc. However, the comment I want to make about technology is that it's all very well, you know, with Zoom and all that, but I have a concern about technology to do with social media. I must say that uh, whereas I'll use Zoom and, uh, you know, all the different um, webinar type technologies, uh, I have a concern about social media and the various harms of social media that we hear about. Um, and also that, uh, so I don't use Twitter, I don't use Facebook, I'm on LinkedIn, but I never really use it because I think that there's a lot of scope for abuse on, we've heard a lot about it on social media. And also not only abuse in terms of verbal abuse, but uh, fraud and so on mm. that 
where social media has come into play. And I think older people uh, can be very subject to this type of abuse. Uh, people trying to deprive them of their savings and so on. Mm -hmm. uh, so I'm just making that comment about mm -hmm. um, the careful use of technology. It's wonderful in one way, but in other ways, I think we have to be very careful about the use of technology yeah. uh, because others may well uh, subject older people to abuse, especially on, on uh, social media. So it's just a comment I'm making. I don't know whether you agree with that or um, oh, yeah. have any experience of it. It has good and bad, I think. Uh, definitely all things are possible. There's a lot of fraud, but there are also, on, I find that I like to some extent uh, my own Facebook. I only put on people I want to be on. I can uh, deal with people who say things that I don't like. And um, I think you have to also manage it to some degree. You have to be able to kind of block people or, or whatever if they are doing these things. But I agree. I mean, unfortunately, people abuse everything that happens in life. Eh? There are always, yeah. always a minority of people who are going to abuse. Um, and we have to choose. And there are good things about Twitter. There are bad things. I mean, it's it, it's 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 difficult to assess for us. I uh, send if I think things are, are, are weird, I send them to my daughter to check out. And and she's usually right because once I did get frauded uh, through the. Uh, on my computer and through through the telephone as well, and um, I don't. Oh, and also, the person pursued me for quite a while, basically until oh. I actually stopped this. Because, and the police did nothing. I have to say, the fraud the fraud people, honestly, they don't do anything. So it's it, that's another big problem in the area of fraud, that there are hundreds of people that get frauded, but uh, there's, there's not a good uh, way of stopping it. So you're right in your comments. We all have to be very aware and to make sure that anything that looks weird or if they're asking for your information that's private, you should not be giving it. You have to be careful what you do. Anyway, I think we've come to the end as an organization. A little bit of feedback from you, if you could send me an email or send, uh, Caitlin actually could send, uh, has sent you this feedback slide. So if you could just fill it out and send it back to Caitlin or to me. Uh, first of all, I, well, I'll, I'll, I'll do that after the thanks. But basically I wanna say, just summarize four things that I have said that are the best way of preventing uh, ageism. The first was empowerment which even the literature, the scientific studies that have said that empowerment is the best antidote to ageism, which means speaking out about mistreatment and societal mistreatment of older adults or younger uh, or, or young people too, if they're discriminated against or policies that are, discriminate, uh, we have to speak out and, and we have to be empowered and, and not let ourselves be kind of oppressed uh, by what's going on. Making complaints is part of empowerment. I know that uh, it's very difficult in long-term care to make complaints because you're always afraid that the person who, who is your loved one is, will be vulnerable. But if we don't make complaints, nothing gets done, nothing gets changed. Um, joining with other organizations gives more strength. It's really, really important for major issues such as long-term care to get together and to, I think this way we can make a difference. There is a big coalition that's happening with several organizations, larger organizations who are speaking to the government about changes. 
And for real changes, we need concrete structural changes and not just minor changes like making tomorrow's food better. Um, if you notice the minister, our minister was talking about, but she talks about everything that's relevant, but it's not super relevant, sadly. Um, in other words, we need a lot of changes. We, people need to be as comfortable as they are in their homes and communities at the end of their lives. And we have to try to strive toward making things better in that way. This is my opinion. Um, may not be yours, but it, from what I've heard today, it sounded as if it was. The next thing is to see setbacks as challenges and opportunities. So um, to be realistic, as Dolly pointed out, I like that uh, comment. Um, I was always told I'm not very, I'm, I'm over positive and not always realistic, but I think I am uh, fairly realistic. And uh, I think it's important to challenge ourselves. To check ourselves for self ageism is number three, and not make excuses for continuing to learn and grow in spite of setbacks. As uh, was it Astrid said, uh, she was talking about how to constantly learn, et cetera, new things. That's very important. And finally, turning bad treatment of older adults and vulnerable people into good treatment by raising our voices together. I'd like to really see that we don't tolerate as much as possible and we do what we can, whether it's writing to a politician, whether it's writing an article, or whether it's just speaking out in meetings, making complaints. I'd really like to see that we're turning societal bad treatment by generating discussion about it and also by raising our voices together about it. So I hope McGill will do that. And all of you, I thank you so much for doing this today. I love to speak with you. I love to see that there are people from outside Quebec. This is my first actually, where we had people from outside Quebec, which is wonderful. I didn't even think about that actually, to tell you the truth. Um, what, I have been speaking to people all over Quebec, as far as Gaspé, uh, everywhere in Quebec. So that, that has been something which I couldn't have done if I had to kind of take planes and run around all the time. But it became feasible because of the pandemic to some degree that I could do it through Zoom. So technology does have good stuff. So thank you.